Okay, and welcome to another exciting edition, screencast edition, uh, this time talking about fascism and specifically fascism in Italy. Now, we had talked previously about what fascism is exactly in class, and fascism is in short a political ideology in which the authority of the government is highly centralized, all right, and it's characterized by extreme nationalism, racism, and militarism. Right. So it's one of those things that this is a, a, a fascist style of government is kind of similar to communism in the sense that it's highly authoritarian, highly centralized. Um, but it's it's a diametrically opposed system because they view the world through a nationalistic lens, militaristic lens, as opposed to communism, which views it um, more of a kind of a class lens. So communists view the world as rich versus poor, whereas fascists view the world as well, it's my country versus your country, my group versus your group. It glorifies the state over the individuals, which means that the, the individual rights uh, are lost and some freedoms are lost at the individual level. Uh, and you justify that by saying it's for the common good. So fascism, again, it, it probably sounds a little bit familiar because it's one of these things where it has a lot of um, aspects that are similar to democracy, just more so. In democracy, we promote the common good. You should do what is best for the community. Sacrifice a little bit of your individual um, uh, potential success for that that will benefit the community. You know, think George Washington giving up Mount Vernon or working there and going, fighting, leaving the Continental Army or leading the country. He gave up what was in his own personal best interest to act in a selfless manner. The difference, though, is that we try and strike that balance in a democratic society between individual rights versus common good. In a fascist society, it is all common good. And the problem is it's the common good that is dictated by the government, which I think the common good that we see in a democratic society is more community-based. It's more uh, the people around you that drive what is for the best, as opposed to top-down, which is more authoritarian, more fascist. The government also has total control over every decision. It's in complete and total control. Now, why fascism? Well, again, we have to understand it in context. We have to understand that communism is a radical result of World War I. World War I shattered the European perspective um, of the world, of themselves, of the universe, um, of their psyche. And so they need an alternative. Communism provides that alternative uh, path. Communism is not what got Europe into World War I. Communism as an idea has been kicking around at this point for decades. And so communism is highly attractive to a lot of Europeans. All right, we see that with the Soviet Union, and they turned communist uh, in the final years of World War I and really solidified their reign in the 1920s. That being said, communism isn't for everybody. Some people are terrified of communism, especially those that are wealthy um, and those that like their culture. Because again, when communism takes over, it is systematically dismantling uh, those nationalistic traditions. So you're giving up much of your culture, you know, your traditional way of living, your religious holidays. And, you know, people don't like that. Some people don't. Some people believe strongly and love their country and love their traditions and love their way of life. They just don't want to end up fighting in a massive war. And so fascism provides an alternative avenue. Fascism is one of those things that says we can provide the stability that you're looking for to get through this turbulent time. They're virulently anti-communist. They can't stand communists. Um, they, they double down on that nationalistic pride and they're offering some intense social change. Um, they're promising some real dramatic social changes here. And for fascists, it is extraordinarily attractive to those that would be within their definition of uh, who their nation is. In other words, if you are a German and there are German fascists promoting, um, you know, what it means to be German and benefiting Germany and all that stuff, it is an attractive item. Uh, you know, certainly more attractive for the middle and upper class than communism would be. That being said, if you fall outside of a fascist predetermined boundaries of what a nation is, obviously it's less than desirable. So that in the case of Nazi Germany, if you were Jewish, it doesn't matter how far back your, your family goes in, in German lineage, it doesn't matter how long you've been in Germany, the fact that you're Jewish precludes you from being German in the eyes of the Nazi party. Ergo, fascism is clearly not beneficial to them. So it, again, fascism really depends on where you draw that line. Now, in communism versus fascism, how they are similar, how they're different, this is one of those things that people sometimes get confused. They are both, start with the similarities here. 
It's a totalitarian government. We call it totalitarian because it means total control. The state is supreme. Nothing is above the country. There's no, don't worry about religion. Don't worry about familial obligations. It's the government that is everything. The government is the sole reason for all the good things. And those saboteurs are the sole reason for all the bad things. It's the denial of individual rights. And again, we in in kind of the Western democratic societies like the United States, we look at this as being like, oh, this is terrible. This is awful. But again, they're justifying it by saying you're doing it to benefit the community. So there's something noble in that is the way they're selling it. Yes, you lose your individual right to freedom of speech, but you gain the cohesion with your community, which allows you to become more successful, have more profit, um, whatever it might be. And then clearly using terror and secret um, police to maintain control. I mean, that's kind of a given, especially with the Gestapo in um, Gestapo in Nazi Germany and the NKVD in the Soviet Union. Now, how they differ, again, is, is how we're looking at the world. Communism is looking at the world as rich versus poor. They view the world as uh, you know, ready for a worldwide conflict, but it's rich versus poor, nationality, religion, that stuff doesn't matter. It's the, the only thing that really comes down to is money. That's the true difference because middle class folks in one country versus another are remarkably similar and they should get over these um, boundaries or differences that are imposed upon them from on high. So then we go on to fascism. Fascism, again, nationalism. The only thing that matters is your national identity. And because of that, you kind of look at the whole world as being um, weaker, suspect, you know, adversarial kind of thing. So that's the big difference between communism and fascism. They are similar on a practical level in terms of how they execute their authority and how they run their country on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the power structure, the power hierarchy is what I mean. But in terms of how they view the world and the, the narrative of where they fit, totally different, right? Fascism, we are the greatest. We're going to take over the world. We're amazing. We're awesome. Communism, you know, we're going to save the world from these capitalist pigs and so forth and so on. Now, the European governments in the 1930s primarily were one of these three groups. You know, Italy, Germany, and Spain were fascist, right? The Soviet Union was communist. And again, that's don't discount that one country being communist. That's a big country. You know, the Soviet Union kind of dominates the scene, especially when you talk about a, a political ideology that had been kind of haunting Europe, again, for the decades prior to uh, the Soviet Union turning communist. So, yeah, it's only one country that's communist, but there are communist groups in every major European country, especially at the end of World War One. And then you have democracy, all right, in Britain and France in the 1930s. But keep in mind, democracy has taken a couple hits here. France was democratic, and they walked into World War One. Um, and then uh, trying to follow that American model and kind of following capitalism, free market kind of thing, you know, that walks right into the economic depression. So of these three, democracy seems like the worst possible bet, uh, considering, you know, where you are in the 1930s. In Italy in particular, let's talk about the rise of this guy here, Benito Mussolini, Il Duce. We know that post-war Italy was in terrible shape. Uh, their economy was in tatters. They didn't get what they wanted out of the war, so they felt kind of robbed. Um, and they didn't really cover themselves in glory during the war anyway. So for Italy, the end of World War I is a godsend, but it's also like, oh my goodness, now, now the real problems begin because you know we have to pay down the debt. We didn't get what we wanted to go to war for. All these people seem to have died in vain. We didn't actually fight that well. So Mussolini's going to take advantage of these you know, this discontent, this frustration, this anger, this resentment, and he's going to kind of bring it into a party, a fascist party. Now, the great thing about fascism from Mussolini's perspective is it's, it's hard to define. It's hard to nail down. And in that sense, it can be many things to many different people. And that's what's so great about fascism because they all agree, oh, Italy is the greatest, but the economic system, eh, we'll figure it out. You know, whether like, are there going to be unions allowed in fascism? Eh, we'll figure it out. So, the Italian people are going to buy into fascism in large part because Mussolini makes an appeal um, to them on nationalistic grounds and is very light on the specifics. Now, his followers are the black shirts, right? They, they wear black shirts. That's kind of why they're called the black shirts, you know? And they're going to use violence and intimidation to take control of local governments, all right? And they call themselves the Fascist Party because of the Fascis, which was a bundle of sticks wrapped around the axe that represents unity and authority. Again, the power of one stick can be snapped, but the, the group can't. And that's the idea is that it's the, the power of working together. 
1922, Mussolini takes a, makes a bold step and he marches on Rome. Now, Mussolini, he had support of fascists, clearly, um, but he didn't have a, they weren't in the government, national government in any large numbers. Like he never had a majority uh, group in the chamber of deputies, if you will. Like they, they were a prominent party, but they were still very much a minority party. So they act aggressively. So his black shirts march on Rome, tens of thousands of there, and King Italy of Mussolini asks Mussolini to form a government as prime minister and, and kind of hands power over to him. The argument here is twofold. One, King Victor Emmanuel does not want a civil war, which is sensible. And two, Italy is suffering from a bit of a communist problem. Communism is making gains in Italy. People are listening and, and, and believing in it. And again, if you have a communist problem, well, you call a fascist. They're the natural enemy. If you have a rat infestation, if you have rats of medium size, um, then you call in cats. That's what you do. So Il Duce, you know, he gets the leader. All these fascist leaders have like nicknames, you know, Il Duce, De Fuhrer, things like that. So he promises to bring the stability back to Italy, return the glory of Rome, the good old days, you know, make Italy, you know, what it used to be. Italy is still technically a parliamentary democracy, but realistically, on a practical level, they just do what Mussolini says. He's got secret police. Um, he arrests critics. Uh, he brings elections, all that kind of stuff. Now, it is a totalitarian, totalitarian form of government under Mussolini in Italy. It is worth noting, though, that while it is totalitarian, and you can't argue otherwise, the the kind of spirit of a lot of the Italian people and the incompetence in some parts of Mussolini's government prevents it from being the level of totalitarian regime that we see in the Soviet Union and Hitler's Germany. So when we talk about totalitarian regime and secret police, in Soviet Union and in Germany, they carried out to a level of perfection that is terrifying. In Italy, yes, Mussolini has basically unchecked power, but the implementation of some of the things that he wants to do is, is intermittent. He never really has the level of authority or control over his country that Hitler and, and uh, Stalin do. And we, we see that really come to effect at the end of World War II, but we'll get to that later. Now, Mussolini's Italy uh, is... Their economy is kind of kept out of state control, but it's maintained to be capitalist. So it's, in other words, the government is, is basically encouraging the economy to grow, um, to make a profit, but the government has its kind of hand in the, the cookie jar, if you will. So what we're saying here is, it again, I'm hesitant to use the term socialism because it's not quite like that. In a socialist economy, you have the government kind of playing the referee you know, uh, telling you what the rules are, telling you to drive on the side of the road or that side of the road. In Italy, it's more the government has the steering wheel and like, you know, you're driving this way now, you're driving that way. So businesses are under state control, but you're allowed to make a profit. So the idea is that you still have that capitalist motivation, but you're doing it with direction from the uh, government. And you would be like, well, Mr. Wigan, that sounds a lot like communism because doesn't that what the communist state does? Yes, in the sense that the government does tell them what to do. Uh, factories, what to build, how much to make, et cetera, et cetera, except the big difference would be that any profits from the factory in a communist system would, quote unquote, go back to the workers as opposed to, you know, being allowed to be kept by the, the folks that are running the factory. So that's it. Production as a result of this did increase, but at the workers' expense. Strikes were not allowed. Wages were kept very, very low. Um, but again, at least you don't have the, the protests and the strikes that you frequently had prior to fascism taking over. So even if things are better, they kind of look better because you don't have to worry about the constant riots and strikes and things like that. In other words, the government owns the means of production, but the goal is to make a profit. In communism, the goal is to share and be classless. So in both fascism and communism, the government owns the means of production. But the difference is, in communism, you're supposed to share that out amongst everybody, whereas in fascism, you're making the money. Uh, obviously, in communism in practice, it doesn't quite work out that way, right? Because the money goes to Stalin, let's be honest. Now, there's also a level of blind loyalty that we see to the state. In fascism, the individual is only important as a member of state. In other words, your position in a uh, fascist society is measured on how you can contribute to the state. So like soldiers are have high rank and um, your major industrialists that provide the state with certain things are, are certainly worthwhile. And that's that's what we're looking at here. So case in point, men are taught to be selfless warriors, fighting for glory. Women are supposed to have lots of kids. Children are indoctrinated from a young age. 
So the idea is that you as an individual are meant to support the state, serve the state. And that's your, that's your overall job is to, um, again, serve the state, help the state, benefit the state. And that's it. Everything else, everything else is, doesn't matter. Everything else is, is, is superfluous for lack of a better term. So to recap here, we see some similarities between fascism and communism, which you looked at the other day. We see blind devotion to the state. You do what the state, the government tells you to do. There's terror and secret police used to keep the people in power. Economies flourish under totalitarianism in part because the government is directing you what to, what to make and is also one of your biggest purchasers. And again, that's, it's kind of like cheating, right? In other words, you, people would look at the com, uh, uh, economy under fascism and be like, oh, like how great the economy is doing. Yeah, but it's easy to say that when the government's going to buy 10,000 tanks and a million pairs of boots and 500,000 uniforms. The government is buying the things they need for a kind of a militant takeover, and they are ensuring that Italian companies get the contracts. So it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes, the economies do flourish under totalitarianism because the government's of complete control, and the government is the one who's ordering all the stuff from the factories that are under government control. So it's kind of like this self-fulfilling kind of ring thing here. It's a closed loop. Uh, unlike capitalism, which is you, you give it to the cheapest bidder, you know, you give it to the lowest bidder. So wherever you get it, the cheapest is where you go. We see tremendous changes to society, both in fascism and communism. You're completely restructuring society. In communism, you're trimming the top in terms of the wealth and you're giving it to the poor. And so you're trying to kind of flatten out that, that societal uh, spectrum and trying to get everybody to be in the, the middle there, that middle class and make everyone uh, the same in terms of the amount of money they have. In fascism, it's less that, it's more trimming the edges in the sense that you're eliminating those from society that are not fascists, that are not fully Italian, that, that don't fit your national ideal. So again, in Germany, it's it's infamous with being the, the Jews. In Italy, it's going to be these other migrant groups, immigrant groups that they're going to try and, and parse out, though not to the degree that they do in Germany. Leaders are popular and people are willing to give up their freedom and rights. The big difference is, again, looking at the nation for fascism, international class warfare for the communists. What the communists want is a class of the society, what fascism not wants, but accepts, for lack of a better term, is defined classes. There's going to be rich, there's going to be poor. Communism is supported by the poor people. All right? Fascism is supported by the businesses and the landowners, usually your traditional uh, elite, because they're going to benefit from fascism, unlike in communism. Although we talked about in class a little bit that in a lot of places, the lower classes would like fascism as well. We see a lot of adherence there because, again, it's that sense of confidence, the swelling of their pride that they get by being a member of a certain uh, group. So in the lower classes that identified as a member of the national uh, group that the fascists were pushing for, they certainly would be in, in favor of it because it moves them up, uh, certainly over their neighbors who may be of different nationalities. All right, so that is fascism and fascism in Italy in a nutshell. If you have any questions, always feel free to email me, and hopefully this will help you make sense of the assignment that you did today, but is due Wednesday of this week.